people this is their first view of Robin Hood's Bay and is an image that will be with them for the rest of their lives. Dominating the scene is Ravenscar, one of the most prominent landmarks on the northeast coast of Yorkshire. It has been used by mariners since before Roman times. This area now receives hundreds of thousands of visitors each year, but only in comparatively recent times. The isolated position of Filingdales, bounded by inhospitable moorland on three sides and the North Sea on the fourth, has meant that today we have an area not only of outstanding natural beauty, but one of great historical interest. And the evidence is all around. The landscape we look upon today may seem timeless, but this is, of course, not true. Over the centuries, many changes have been made, sometimes by the climate, and more recently by the hand of man. The blue shale beds are visible twice a day between tidal washes and close examination of the cliffs reveal further layers of shale over which clay is laid. In the cliffs and on the shore, many fossils of prehistoric sea creatures can be found being constantly exposed by erosion caused by wind, rain and tide. After the last ice age, the retreating glacier left the landscape shaped more or less as it is today, with the higher ground becoming wooded and the lower ground marshy scrubland. Much evidence of man's first presence in the area can be seen on the moors encircling the area in the shape of ancient crosses and numerous tumuli or burial mounds. This one is Robin Hood's butts and Standing Stones, here on Standing Stones Rig. These early people would have lived a semi-nomadic life, making small clearings on the edge of the swamp. Prior to the Roman invasion, the area was inhabited by the Brigantes. The Romans built a string of small forts, signal stations and beacons as part of their coastal defences, one being sighted at Ravenscar. These were destroyed following the departure of the Romans and Anglo-Saxons settled the area after driving the Brigantes westward. The founding of Whitby Abbey in 650 AD brought some order, but the original wooden structure was destroyed by marauding Vikings in 867, when once again lawlessness took over. This was the time of sea raiders, and it would have been extremely dangerous to live on the coast. The Angles themselves were driven out by the Norsemen, who were the first to create a permanent settlement in the area at Raw, a mile or so inland and a steep climb from the sea. These Norwegian settlers were probably also the first to make use of bay for fishing and to keep their boats by the sea. They were farmers and also cleared and cultivated the land.
A legacy from this period are the names of places and land features still in use today, which can be traced back to these pre-Norman conquest days. Stoop Brow is derived from Stoup Brew, which means steep hill. Beck means stream, and Wyke comes from Vic, meaning sea creek. Raw itself is unchanged, meaning row of dwellings. This is probably the oldest building in the area, replacing an original turf structure. It is a typical Norse longhouse with living accommodation for both man and cattle under one roof, separated by a through passage wide enough for animals to turn. Shortly after the Norman conquest, the abbey at Whitby was refounded and rebuilt in stone. The abbey lands included the area of Filingdales, and farms were established at Thorny Brow and Filinghall, whose deer park walls can still be seen today. The ancient Saxon church of St Ives was replaced by a new one, much closer to the village of Raw and the new settlement of Filingthorpe. As the activities of sea raiders diminished, the conditions for trade and fishing were created, and it is likely that the first permanent habitation occurred on the site we know today as Robin Hood's Bay in the 1400s. Henry VIII's mapmaker, Leyland, makes the first known reference, describing it as a fisher townlet of 20 boots with a dock or bosom a mile in length. Other records at the time confirm the existence of Farside House, Middlewood Farm and the mills at Ramsdale and Boggle Hole. The village grew quickly due to Ravenscar being a landfall for mariners and traders and it is illustrated on an early Dutch sea chart published in 1586 complete with gabled cottages and thatched roofs. These early inhabitants were dependent upon the sea either as fishermen or going further afield as mariners. Linked in with this trade was the production of alum, an early dye fixative in the clothing trade at Peak and Stoop Brow, which lasted over 200 years from about 1615. Thanks to the National Trust who have excavated and researched the site, the visitor today can see how this ancient process was performed. The process is quite complex, involving burning the shale and then steeping it in large tanks. The resultant liquor was then channelled to settling tanks and barrels. Marks in the stone show clearly where the barrels stood. The crystals formed by this process, the pure alum, was then taken down the cliffs to be shipped to London, then the centre of the clothing industry. Ships collecting the alum would bring back human urine collected from the streets of London for use in the steeping process. In the 19th century a railway incline was built using winding gear to ease transport to the shore. With about a hundred men loading shale and stoking fires which burnt continuously, it would have resembled a scene from hell. It is now a peaceful home for a colony of seals.
The alum trade and its dependence upon large quantities of coal transported by sea was one of the main reasons why Robin Hood's Bay became such an important ship-owning and seafaring community. All the houses in the old village of Robin Hood's Bay were built between 1650 and 1820. Tucked tightly under the cliff and protected from the worst of the northeast gales. Living here in those times would have been tough and hard, but the inhabitants were not poor, as it was a thriving though isolated community. From about 1700 onwards for a century, Robin Hood's Bay was a major centre for smuggling. Contraband included tea, brandy, silk and of course Geneva or gin would be bought ashore under cover of darkness. The bay's isolated location making it ideal for this illicit trade. The goods would then be transported inland by various routes, one being the ancient track and pack horse trail known as Robin Hood's Bay Road or the Fish Road, leading over the moors to the lonely Salters Gate Inn and onwards to Pickering. Smuggling declined with the coming of the Victorian era, for duties were reduced and with customs officers employing steam vessels, the penalties became too harsh to bear. Fishing reached its peak at this time, and many of the bay's inhabitants were ship owners as well. In 1865, Robin Hood's Bay had more ships registered than Whitby, some 170, with 90 being with the Robin Hood's Bay Insurance Association. Fishing methods in the area have remained virtually unchanged for a thousand years, the skills being passed on from one generation of fishermen to another. Engines have taken the place of oars, and modern materials are used, such as nylon nets and ropes, but it is still difficult and dangerous, requiring a high degree of understanding of wind, tide and the coastline. With no man-made harbour, all boats must be kept on shore, and only in calm condition can they be moored in the bay. Because of this, boat size is limited. A combination of fishing techniques are employed, their use and resultant catch dependent on the time of year. The traditional design of pots are used to catch crabs and lobsters. They are baited and then left for a time, and when hauled up hopefully yield a good catch. Inshore nets are used to catch cod and other species in season, while baited lines are favoured in the winter. The fishing today cannot provide a full-time living, but is carried out to keep old traditions alive. A successful day's fishing is exciting and satisfying, as well as physically demanding, a rare combination in today's world. A look round the old village will reveal many interesting reminders of the past. The dock area is the focal point and is probably the best place to start. It has always been a hive of activity. The row of cottages overlooking the dock is called Cobble Heads, as the boats would be drawn up here. The old lifeboat house now gives relief of a different nature to those in distress. The 
Bay Hotel must have one of the best views of any public house. 200 years ago there were up to a dozen taverns in the village, now there are just three. At high tide the sea comes right onto the slipway and always manages to catch the unwary. The main road into the village, until the sea claimed its upper half and 22 dwellings in 1780, was King Street, the old post office being at its lower end. Albion Street leads to the cliff path and to Filingthorpe. Tyson's steps will take you past the pretty street of Sunnyside and up to the village museum on Fisher Head. Located in what was the coroner's room with the mortuary next door. Here many artefacts are on display and it is well worth a visit. Near here too is Littlewood Cottage, often photographed for its crooked doorway with a coffin window above it. Staircases were too narrow for coffins to be carried up them so special windows were built. Jim Bell style, named after a local carpenter, gives access to the new road built after King Street fell into the sea. The bridge over King's Beck is much older, dating from the early 1600s. Just past Bridge End House is an alley called The Bolts, so named as it was an escape route from the press gang who frequented the area in the late 18th century. The Laurel Inn has a room and cellars which are cut into solid rock. Up the steep one in three bay bank are two rows of brick built cottages of Bloomswell and the Esplanade, built in the 1800s and regarded as relatively new and posh by village standards. But from these streets access can be gained to the square, one of the oldest parts of the village. Here was the old Mariner's Arms, a tavern known to be frequented and used by the smuggling fraternity, who were virtually all the inhabitants of the village. Many of the cottages were named by their previous owners after the names of the ships they captained or sailed in. Coraline was a brig built in Hartlepool in 1857. The streets bear the names of past characters. Martin owned the Laurel Inn and Tommy Baxter was a well-known fisherman. Chapel Street was called Lower Street and was renamed when the Wesleyan Chapel was used as a school in the 1890s and it is now a cafe. The original chapel seating has somehow survived. Looking from what is now the top of King Street there is York House. The Dolphin Inn, formerly the Mason's Arms, is lower down on the right. Local author Leo Wormsley lived in this house from 1894 to 1913 as a young boy. In writing his books he drew heavily upon his own personal observations and experiences and they give a unique insight into life in the village in the early part of the 20th century. Many of the village's past inhabitants are buried in the grounds of the old church of St Stephen's, built in 1821 on the foundations of an earlier medieval church which had stood on this site from about 1100. It is a rare example of a low church built in Georgian times and has a light and airy interior. 
It contains a number of interesting features, including a three-decker pulpit and private pews for the local gentry. Although the new church of St Stephen was built closer to Robin Hood's Bay in 1870, many locals preferred to be buried here. Scrutiny of the crowded gravestones show clearly the heavy toll taken by the sea on the population of the area. Many of the gravestones are merely a mark of respect, the bodies of the deceased missing at sea many thousands of miles away. The sea continues to be a cruel mistress, many ships being lost on the dangerous coast, and even today she continues to take her toll. It is mainly during the winter months that she demonstrates her power, often choosing to flood the dock. It was the opening of the railway between Scarborough and Whitby in 1885 which opened up the delights of the bay to outsiders and ended centuries of isolation and insularity. In the 1890s the new Victorian villas were built by property speculators between the station and the top of the bank leading down into the old village. The villagers, keen to avail themselves of spacious living and the comforts of bathrooms with hot and cold water indoors, and not just cold from a tap at the end of the street, bought many of these properties, abandoning their old cottages which then became available for letting to tourists. Holidaymakers, visitors and sightseers have come in ever increasing numbers, today mainly by car. The railway closed in 1965 but it still serves the visitors well, the old goods yard being the main car park, the old track bed offers excellent walking, riding and cycling, and a great way to get to either Whitby or Scarborough. What does the future hold for this beautiful area? How long can it be preserved? The building of the seawall in 1975 and further coastal protection works completed in 2003 have undoubtedly given a lease of life to many buildings which would otherwise have been lost. But for how long? Will the village be swamped by the sea or a tide of tourists, or both? Recent surveys seem to show that it can cope with people on foot, but not with motorised traffic. Whatever the future does hold, we must hope that its character and its spirit can remain intact and it can continue to exert its subtle influence on the generations to follow as it has on the generations who have already passed. <laughs>